One of the things that I so very much love to talk about on this channel are the companies that affect you as a gamer, but which you've never heard of. Perhaps if you have heard of them, you didn't realize how influential they were, or maybe you've forgotten that they existed at all. Tencent is one of those companies that a lot of people have no idea just how big they really are. Some of these companies, though, they're a little harder to even identify. They change names and allow their subsidiaries a much broader, wider amount of freedom, further distancing themselves from the public. THQ Nordic is one such company, but I don't mean the publisher of games like Remnant from the Ashes, Sunset Overdrive, or Generation Zero. I'm talking about their owner, previously also called THQ Nordic, or recently they've changed their name to Embracer Group. Yes, the Embracer Group, not THQ Nordic, though they've also gone by Nordic Games Publishing, Game Outlet Europe, and Nordic Games Group. But no one really knew who they were until they became THQ Nordic. Of course, this is not the THQ that you know from when you were a kid. No, they bought the THQ trademark back when THQ went bankrupt, but we'll go over that. If you're already feeling confused over the many names and how convoluted it's already gotten in the first two paragraphs, that's sort of how this company operates. They like to change their name a lot, and they're never in a hurry to clarify exactly who they are. They often allow companies they own to be the voice of a decision, even when that decision's credit is given to the Embracer management team later on, and this tends to lead to even more confusion. I should know. I've written, recorded, re-recorded, rewritten, re-re-recorded, re-re-written, and finally re-re-re-recorded it, and I still think it's kind of confusing. So in order to make things much clearer throughout this video, I will refer to this core group as Embracer, regardless of the name they used at the time. Any mention of any other company will be the original one that bore that name, and any mention of Embracer will be this new company. Today, Embracer represents between 26 and 98 studios, depending on how you look at it, and growing every single year. They own or control companies like Saber Interactive. They own Amplifier, an investment collective that boasts partner and subsidiary companies like Miscellaneous Games, Framebunker, Fall Damage, Cavalry, Tarsier, Palindrome, River's End, and C77. They own Coffee Stain and Lava Potion. And of course, the largest two parts of the company, first Coke Media with Deep Silver, Dam Buster, Deep Silver, Fish Labs, Milestone, Warhouse, Volition, and Voxler. And then finally, THQ Nordic, which is inclusively a publisher, developer, distributor, and asset portfolio. THQ Nordic has under it Black Forest Games, Bugbear Experiment 101, Grimlore, Gunfire, Handy Games, Mirage, Nine Rocks, Pieces Interactive, Piranha Bytes, Rainbow Studios, and THQ Nordic Barcelona. These are just the studios they own today. They've sold many off and they've purchased and acquired many other studios' trademarks intellectual properties. From Appeal's Outcast, Stainless's Carmageddon, Crytek's Time Splitters, 38's Kingdoms of Amalur, Atari's Alone in the Dark, Slipgate's Rad Rogers, Nova Logic's Delta Force, Digital Reality, Sign Mora, and Imperium Galactica, Relic's Impossible Creations, 2015's Men of Valor, Bit Composer's Jag Alliance, The Adventure Company's entire library, Joe Wood's library, Dreamcatcher's library, and of course the original THQ's library. Yes, it's a huge amount of names. Embracer today owns a ridiculously huge amount of gaming's intellectual property. A billion dollars worth of intellectual property, spanning decades of history and dozens of studios. They own a huge chunk of the entire industry, employ thousands of workers, and work with hundreds of studios, releasing dozens of games a year. And it was started in 1990 by a 13-year-old. Yes, that's correct. Today's billion-dollar Embracer was started in a garage by 13-year-old Lars Wingifers as a way for him to sell used comic books through the mail. And at 13 years old, he managed to make about $30,000 a year. By 16, Lars decided to move into video games, naming his first venture Nordic Games, and this time he made half a million dollars in his first year. He opened seven retail stores across Sweden, bought out some competitors, and sold to gameplay.
Play.com in March of 2000 for about $9.8 million, or around $14.7 million today. About a year later, Gameplay.com would experience some serious financial troubles, rebranding themselves as Game. And they sold Lars back his retail stores for one krona, about 10 cents. Eventually, this retail version would go bankrupt, but Lars had made a name and millions of dollars for himself and partners in the venture capital world. Using these connections and his funding, he would start Embracer's Forerunner Company, at the time also called Nordic Games, but also also called Game Outlet Europe, and thus starting his history of confusingly rebranding everything to the point that as I write this video, I wonder if it could ever possibly be understood clearly. I want you to know I'm really trying to keep things simple. Lars, at the time, decided to essentially go back to his roots, buying unsold stock of games from larger companies like EA, repackaging them, and then selling them in grocery stores, pharmacies, homeware stores, and Sweden's version of Home Depot, essentially taking all of the penny copies of a game and filling up the $1 bargain bins that so many of us got our first games from. He also got into game creation, and one of the core ideas behind the creation of this development side was to find popular, trendy games that didn't exist on multiple platforms and create a competitor. One such game was SingStar, a popular game on PlayStation. Lars would take SingStar and create a version for Nintendo called Wii Sing, and it sold very, very well, bringing in tens of millions of dollars for Embracer. In fact, sales were only limited by the number of Logitech microphones that could be manufactured. After this, Embracer just started buying things. They bought Joe Wood, a similarly structured game developer, publisher, and holding company, with titles like Industry Giant, Transport Giant, and Neighbors from Hell, and who itself owned Dreamcatcher Interactive, probably most well-known for being the publisher of Painkiller, and for creating The Adventure Company, who further still itself would release games like Sam and Max, Still Life, Mysterious Journey, and more. Then THQ went bankrupt. THQ was a huge publisher, well-known in the industry, and its death was not exactly unexpected. Homefront was not warmly received, Red Faction Armageddon wasn't a huge seller, and they'd made a massive error in buying licenses for expensive children's titles. Right around the time, games like Farmville, Angry Birds, and Plants vs. Zombies were becoming popular, and siphoning away those kids and their attention. This led to THQ selling off their studios, selling off their IP, and trying to hold on. Unfortunately, they didn't manage to do that, and they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. During this process, they sold games and studios to Crytek, Sega, Take-Two, Ubisoft, and Coke Media, and then sold the rest of the company to Embracer. After a lot of court battles, because any company that goes from a billion dollars in revenue to owing hundreds of millions of dollars in debt is going to have a lot of court battles, Embracer owned the THQ name, and they started using it. They changed their development name and their holding name to include THQ in order to take advantage of the history of the brand, and became even more confusingly hard to differentiate. Then, to make things even better, they bought Coke Media Holding, the holding company that owned Coke Media, which owned Deep Silver. Deep Silver, of course, bought Crytek, who bought stuff from THQ, and so did Coke Media. So really, this was a very long-winded way of buying all the stuff they didn't get when THQ went bankrupt. They bought Coffee Stain Holding, the holding company that owned Coffee Stain, and around this time developed a serious identity crisis. But it wasn't done yet, no. Embracer would go on to buy another investment company, Goodbye Kansas Game Invest, which eventually became the core group of Amplifier Game Invest and it would even buy parts of itself, including the original Game Outlet Europe, which was still owned by Lars and some other investors. By buying itself, it was now a single company, confusingly named THQ Nordic, owner of THQ Nordic, which bought THQ and owned Nordic, but now THQ Nordic owned Nordic and THQ Nordic. It's really simple and obvious. Then they bought Saber Interactive as a cherry on top. As you can see, the name change to Embracer was 
well, absolutely necessary. The company was frankly impossible to talk about and confusing to everyone involved. Were we talking about the original THQ or the THQ Nordic Development Company or the holding company or the THQ Nordic Barcelona satellite branch? It was impossible. This is actually what I blame today for the fact that Embracer has been named Embracer since 2019 and yet nobody really knows who they are. This company has 108 titles in active development from 31 studios in at least 11 countries, representing over 3,600 employees in the gaming industry. That means they represent something like 4% of all the gaming industry. And yet, outside of games journalists and stock managers, no one's ever heard of them. So the name change was needed and welcomed. Of course, there's also the conspiracy theory that they changed their name after a disastrous 8chan AMA which resulted in their PR director saying, and I quote, I am not a <laughs> nor into <laughs> And I'm mostly throwing this in here because it's hilarious, not because I actually believe the conspiracy theory. So we end up with today's Embracer, a holding company that no one knows about. In fact, most people will assign all of their goodwill to THQ Nordic, who did work on some games that I personally really enjoyed. For a while there, THQ Nordic was basically my top studio, working on titles I was excited to play. I knew they weren't the old THQ. I assumed they were one of the old studios that had survived somehow. And I know others who had the same misconception. I also never associated them with Coke Media, which isn't surprising considering Coke spent years telling everyone they weren't for sale. And neither Embracer nor Coke have really been upfront about clarifying the ownership. Who owns what? Who responds to whom? Who is in charge of what and when? These are very unclear questions, and I don't have an answer. What is clear, however, is the path that Embracer has set themselves upon. And that is the path of highest profits with no regards for consumer happiness. And they're able to do that really easily because they have so many company names and they shuffle around like three card Monty. Metro Exodus being pulled from Steam to release on Epic Games. Yeah, that was Coke Media, AKA Embracer. Shenmue 3's confusing publication, again, Deep Silver, aka Embracer. Satisfactory being unceremoniously pulled from Steam? Yeah, that's Embracer. And the response to these complaints? Embracer never stepped up. The owned studios took the heat. Profits up, they're happy with the decisions. That's not really surprising, I suppose, considering this is a company that was started to sell second-hand video games no one wanted in the bargain bin, and not as a passion project. Additionally, a company exists to see profit, and this is a publicly held company at that. They've got shareholders who demand returns on their investments, and that's fine. No one begrudges Embracer for making money. But we should be clear about blame. There's no point boycotting Epic for exclusives if we assign no blame to Embracer for taking the money for a huge amount of games, not just Coke's Metro Exodus. There's no point being mad at 4A and Coffee Stain for also going exclusive with Epic because it was Embracer who signed off on the decision. No matter how much freedom Embracer says it allows its subsidiaries to hold, the fact of the matter is that Embracer adds the tens of millions of dollars that Epic pays out to their own budget reports. The buck really does stop with them. Embracer also is the owner of hundreds of games that will almost certainly never see a revival or sequel or big budget movie like Saints Row, Metro, or Goat Simulator. They're just not profitable enough for a developer of their size, and I think that probably means they're dead. Will there ever be a sequel to Kingdoms of Amalur? Or do they just own the rights because it was cheap? and they can sell it in the bargain bin for $1 for the next 10 years and eventually turn a profit. What reason is there for them to buy the Outcast IP if not to simply sit on it and absorb penny profits for another 20 years? Will there ever be a Time Splitters reboot when it has to compete for time and attention against a fifth Saints Row? 
Is it any surprise that the first time we hear about the remaster for SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, the company working on it is a not-quite-owned-but-only-works-for-Embracer substudio with a very mixed record of success? I still have no answers to these, and I don't know if we ever will. I hope you know a bit more about Embracer, that you're aware they exist, and they own their share of credit and blame for things they do, and rightfully so. And that THQ Nordic and THQ Nordic and and THQ and Nordic are all the same company, but not all the same company. It's so easy. Please consider sharing this video because it really helps us out, but feel free not to. If you'd like to watch another video, you can click on one in the corner right now, and as always, we'll see you on the next one.